Good morning. Welcome to the Thurston County Board of County Commissioners Board Work Session for Wednesday, April 10th, 2024. It is 9.03 a.m. My name is Ty Menser, Chair of the Board. To my left is Vice Chair Commissioner Wayne Fournier. We have Commissioner Emily Klaus and Commissioner Carolina Mejia. Commissioner Edwards is excused today. Um, County Manager Leonard Hernandez and Assistant County Manager Robin Campbell and uh, our Thurston County Sheriff Derek Sanders and his team um, for the first agenda item. For public virtual attendance, you may follow along on the Thurston County YouTube channel. We are in session for three hours to take up an, a variety of topics. I believe we've allotted, isn't it, 30 minutes for this topic? Okay. So the first topic, roughly 30 minutes, Thurston County Sheriff Office Aviation Program. We have the sheriff and his team, so I'll just turn it straight to Sheriff Sanders. Thank you. Good morning, board. Um, so as I discussed a couple meetings ago, um, the sheriff's office has been in the procurement process uh, long since before I took office to acquire a helicopter. Um, the helicopter, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Chief, it's through the surplus program through the military. It's a, a training helicopter. I believe the model is a KH-57. Is that TH a TH-57? Um, it's, it's basically the, the small little helicopters that they train on in the military. Um, they've been surplused. Apparently, there's a lot of them coming out. So the reason I want to provide this presentation is that it looks more likely than ever that um, we will actually be able to attain one of these helicopters. Uh, Thurston County Sheriff's Office is the fifth largest sheriff's office in the state. All four sheriff's offices that are larger than us all have aviation programs. Um, it is considered a basic function of, of sheriff's offices for our size, especially when you consider the, the diverse geographical um, landscape that we have in Thurston County. Um, the sheriff's office is responsible for all the waterways in Thurston County. Um, that includes even the, all the lakes and, and the Puget Sound, um, all the rivers. All by default, they fall to us. And so um, we have some numbers. I, I know Chief Mencius has some statistics he'll, he'll pass on to you guys. I didn't really want to go over that in the 30-minute uh, presentation. But um, we respond to a ton of water rescues every year. Um, and essentially, the, the helicopter program uh, through the PowerPoint that I sent you guys has a number of different purposes. Um, to start the program up and get it off its feet, the plan is to utilize the helicopter as a search and rescue asset. Um, so between Capitol Forest and all of our waterways, uh, the helicopter would be a much more efficient way to extract people, um, locate people, and assist in those operations um, compared to just a ground search, um, which typically includes you know, dozens of volunteers and commission staff. Um, furthermore, the uh, helicopter unit in the future can also be then, the, the program can also then shift to pursuit mitigation as well, um, as we've seen. And I've, I've posted tons of videos on social media and whatnot of the benefits of uh, like Smokey's airplane with Washington State Patrol and the ability for that airplane to intercept vehicles that are fleeing. And um, yesterday I presented on some different pursuit alternative technologies. And while those were more of a pilot to figure out if they work, what we already know works is air support. Um, everyone's probably seen the LAPD footage of all the cars taken off and, and all these different things. And here with Smokey, the issue with Smokey is that uh, Washington State Patrol's airplane is responsible for the western half of Washington State. So it is not it is not Thurston County's airplane. It's not even Washington State Patrol Thurston County Detachment's airplane. Um, it is constantly going up and down the I-5 corridor. Um, and so the ability for us to have our own air unit um, that we can dispatch at our own at our own convenience um, would be a huge asset for us. Um, as far as the costs of the program. Uh, because the, the helicopter will be used for search and rescue and for um, marine response, um, we get a lot of distress calls about marine units. And one of the things that, that Chief Mencius has explained to me is that, you know, the, the amount of gas that we burn sending our big boat out to the sound um, just to find people who are like, we're fine, um, where the helicopter would be able to spin up and within, you know, 10, 15 minutes say, yeah, they're not in distress, they're all good to go. Um, and then at that point in time, it's not it's not an emergency. We don't have to send two yeah, two deputies out on overtime and burning. I think it's what almost 50 gallons of fuel per hour. Um, and then I believe what was the helicopter off the top of my head? About 25. About 25. So at half the rate of of spending fuel, we can go get things done faster. Um, and then again, the the Capital Forest stuff has also been kind of a nightmare for us. Um, and and you know we've we've also seen this with missing persons. Um, you know we've had people go missing but we have a last point of context. Um, and the other important thing to recognize is that we've already acquired a number of pieces of equipment for the unit. Um, Chief Mencius, actually, when King County's Guardian One, the helicopter that they run, 
uh, was being surplused, he actually went up there and acquired their old FLIR system, um, which I believe is what a couple hundred thousand dollar unit. Yeah. Um, so we actually have already acquired one of the most expensive pieces of the helicopter, which is the FLIR camera. Um, and that's what allows us to see heat signatures. Um, so the ability to search for missing people, um, conduct rescues. The helicopter is not um, a big Huey where you've got teams rappelling off the side of it. It's, it's like a little tiny four-seater helicopter. Um, and there's no rappelling off the helicopter or anything like that. The system does come with, what's the name of the, the carrier system? It's a, a hex system. Yeah, and so what that allows us to do is basically pluck people up and pick them up and drop them off. So um, if you can imagine the Nisqually River um, is a very dangerous river. We have a lot of drownings, and the reason for that is that there's obviously a lot of log turnover and things under the surface. Um, and it's an extremely dangerous operation for our dive team to get out there oftentimes and try to rescue people um, who are stranded on the river. And the ability for the helicopter to drop the hex system, pick someone up, and then just put them on land safely where a rescue party is waiting um, reduces the risk for... for so it dive. comes with this. It doesn't come with this, but uh, not with those helicopters. Do they currently have it? It's, called, it's new technology. You don't run like I. You don't run anything with this on it now, right? Civil operations don't do that operation. Yeah. So, like to my knowledge, there's nobody in the region that can do anything like this. Like even, even at JBLM getting support. Like you used to be able to call a JBLM helicopter, and then like since basically since the Afghan war, I haven't even heard of anything being available in the region for doing like pickoffs out in the woods or anywhere dangerous. Uh, you know, for a period Coast of Guard, you know, like you can call Coast Guard, but that's that's not easy no. to do. And they use they a, cover a winch, all the West Coast too. They use a winch system on yeah. most of those. I know when JBLM in the past years, I think after 9-11, they did some support because there wasn't a lot of aircraft that were allowed. Yeah. Um, and they helped with the medevac side of the house, but there was only just a transport. I think they, they flew somebody from Skookum Chuck back to yeah, that again. You used to be able to call MAST and they would come, but that's, it's been like 20 years since that's existed. And then if you call the Coast Guard, they don't even, they don't have people that'll hang off the, the ropes either. They, they show up and they hope that you've got somebody on the ground that can hook up. And when you hook, like I've seen them where they're like, mm, eeny, meeny, miny, mo, you're the one that's gonna hook up to the rope. And like, so there, there is currently no one in the region that can do anything like this. And that, that, I think that's important to know. Yeah, and you know, even like Snohomish County, which is one of those larger counties that has, they, they run a Huey, but they run a winch system. So they're rappelling out of a bay door and going down and, and, com and coming back up into the helicopter. And you can't just call Snohomish County and be like, hey, send us your helicopter no. with your... It no, it doesn't work like that. Uh, we try, but Snohomish County is quite a ways away. Um, you can't even really get Guardian 1 down here, which is King County's helicopter. Uh, Pierce County has an airplane. Um, State Patrol has an airplane. And we call for state patrol all the time, but you know, airplanes don't rescue people out of rivers. So um, they're really helpful on the pursuit side of things yeah. and like canine tracks and stuff like that. Um, so I just want to point out that this is not just a chase and find bad guys tool. This is a, this is a rescue tool that does not exist regionally right now. Not in Thurston County. No. And one other piece for like the state patrols, the aviation, they don't have the funds or the mission to do search and rescue. Yeah. So you couldn't you couldn't ask them, hey, we have a missing elderly person in the, the woods over here. Can you check for this? They won't do that. It's not part of their, their and, funding. And there's a component of the sheriff's department that we don't often talk about that is search and rescue where you do you do water rescues, you do dive team rescue, like and so that this ties into that. This isn't just chasing down bad guys. This is absolutely responding and picking people out of the woods after they've broken their leg up in Capitol Forest or off the side of a bank or... Yeah, and, and especially in Capitol Forest, you know, there, there are going to be potential scenarios where, where the people are just, they've fallen and they've gotten somewhere where we can't get to them. But even more so, just locating the person yeah. seems to be half the battle, maybe more than half the battle. And, and having something up in the air that has a FLIR system where we can pick up heat signatures, um, that I think is maybe and the most valuable. Like as, a, as a medic or anything like that, hiking into somebody that's 10 miles into the woods is one thing. Carrying them out is not an easy task over, you know, grades, rough terrain. Like it, it, being able to hoist them out is a, is a world of difference. Yeah.
exactly. So um, I don't think I'm missing too much at this point. Uh, so the big question in all this is the funding side of things. Um, so we have the boater fund, and the boater fund is extremely healthy. Um, and so the plan for us was to prorate any services that occur on waterways with the boater fund. So we can use the boater fund to pay for fuel and those kind of those operational needs. So anytime the helicopter is, is sent up in the air and it has anything to do with marine services, at that point in time, we would bill the boater fund, um, which is our, it's already our dedicated fund that can only be used for, for marine services. So I'm, I'm can I just uh, sorry, I don't, I'm, other people probably have questions. I see Carolyn has got a hand up, but this, is, this isn't purchasing a helicopter. So this is not the county writing a check for, I don't know, how much is it? 15, 20, how much, what's one of these helicopters cost? It costs three or four or $500,000. Okay. Yeah, this is not, this is, is this similar to what the county did with, with you 20 years ago, or is this? No. no. The county would be acquiring their helicopter from the federal government surplus system and operating it continuously with a, a program that has a continuous operation. The system before was, a, was an unbudgeted system and wasn't sustainable. So we get it at a screaming deal from the feds, and then as long as we use it for the purposes that we use it for, we can keep it in right. perpetuity. The maintenance costs are big, right? Because there's got to be like a 25-hour. You, I, I don't know those things, but you, you know, like yes. there's costs to, and you would be performing those, but we own the helicopter. Do we then have to write you checks? Or I think there was something where. Like, and stop me if I'm like way out of line, but like you set up a system where it's almost like a, like you're, there's some don't, not donations, but they're, you know, your maintenance costs get like you tabulate a bill and then, you know, that bill is a debt to the feds. And then how do, and then if the helicopter, I'll, I'll stop back, you there because I'll let him ex so that basically that was that's what makes this so attractive is that helicopter Northwest, which is, you know, he's the CEO of helicopter Northwest here at the Tumwater Airport. Um, Northwest. Helicopter. Northwest helicopter. Sorry. World renowned. They service King County and King County Guardian one. They do all these helicopter upfittings and services um, and they have offered to pay for almost everything for this program. Um, as, a, as basically a, a service to the county. So the maintenance, they've offered to cover entirely. The pilots, they've offered to provide entirely. Um, we would be responsible for the insurance, which because his pilots have so much service time, the insurance was absorbable within the budget. I think the quote was twelve to $15,000 a year. Um, and then the fuel, those are the, those are the things that we would be responsible for. Um, Northwest Helicopters has offered to retrieve the helicopter for us when it arrives, I believe in Florida, uh, is maybe the potential somewhere down in the South. Yeah. Um, when it arrives, they have offered to fly the helicopter for us and they've offered to maintain it for us. Um, and so that's why we're looking at the opportunity to start up an aviation unit here at Thurston County for a very low entry price. So if he's, if you need it to someone and he's busy doing something else, I mean, you, I mean, how, what's, how does that work? We're going to have a plant staff of probably five qualified guys that are just listening. And one of those five will always be on call. You don't have them now, but you're going to have them. We have them all, yes. And the benefit to you, it's, there's some- There's like, no benefit to me. There's write-offs because your time is a donation. It's strictly or, a donation to the community. I've been a member of the community for over 40 yeah. years. I've been in the helicopter business for 40 years. I've been involved in, in the original helicopter program 20 years ago. I saw the benefits of that. Um, I personally saved more than seven lives. Um, the systems they talked about are accurate. I've been on many search and rescues, one in the Capitol Force, for example, and our meeting was longer than it took me to find the guy. It was a lost Alzheimer patient wandering through the woods. We found him in six minutes. That otherwise would have been would probably have been, would a dead have died body. of hypothermia by the yeah. time I all came. I found lost hunters in less than a half an hour that they've been looking for for two days. These are all the advantages that helicopters provide. And I am willing to help the community and help the people and help a program such as this to improve the safety of the county. Now, since that 20 years ago, we've had a lot of change in systems. We've had a lot of change in technology too that actually will improve the system. I personally maintain, as the sheriff said, the aircraft for all of the other counties in the state of Washington. There are currently three other counties that have active helicopter programs 
and maintain all of their helicopters. Through that system, I am able to help join Thurston County together with them and acquire the surplus equipment from these well-funded counties. Now, these counties are obviously well-funded, multi-million dollar funding aviation programs, but they get new equipment often. They have a lot of grant money, they get a lot of new equipment. That secondary equipment, we're able to move to the county and it's a transfer for zero dollars as I understand it. Yep. So doing this on a budget is what we're really trying to do and keep the the fund and the, and the cost low, keeping the helicopter small, keeping the cost small, and keeping the uses specialized. Before, our uses weren't really specialized. We were a wide range of law enforcement uses, and it was expensive, and it, the training was time-consuming. A new system of search and rescue, and then providing you know some surveillance help later on in the future for the runaway cars that are running crazy around this county. Those are really the options that we're looking at helping, and the county needs the help, and we're willing to assist in that. Commissioner McGeehan. Thank you. I have, uh, so, Sheriff, you mentioned insurance for the pilots. I'm wondering uh, the risk insurance for the county. How much would that be? It's 12 to 15. It's 12 to 15 thousand dollars was the estimate. Uh, again, that depends on the aircraft type, and then that solely is provided by uh, the uh, the hours that are for the pilots. So the more hours you have, obviously, the less, less uh, risk that is. Um, so that's where we benefit from that. So and that was uh, from a discussion with Brian Bishop? Uh, no, that was through uh, with risk management, but it went through the, uh, the companies that we previously had insurance before. So same uh, company that the county would use that we used in the past for aviation that the quotes were from them So our our insurance through the risk pool loan would not increase No, this would be specialized just for that aircraft program And you said risk was part of that conversation yes When we acquire these um, Equipment isn't there's like some you, you mentioned something certain uses is there a certain time like we you can't turn around and sell it right so no it's so actually a lease from my understanding when you go through the drmo program you don't actually buy it you the purchase price is usually very cheap it's like 250 bucks or whatever a dollar yeah. um but then you don't actually own the equipment because it's military equipment when you're done with it then it becomes a you have to figure out how you're going to get it back to the government or have it destroyed or whatever that's kind of what it's going to want. Yeah, it's yeah. Cold, you don't, you don't turn it. This company it goes, goes under, and we can't afford to, you know, staff it all up. Then we have this thing. What do we do with it? It's called perpetual loan, is what it is. As a matter of fact, you have it for as long as you need it for life, but you aren't able to own it or sell it. So that's how these assets are now transferred by the federal government. We could transfer it to another agency, though, or it's on that 1033 type program. Okay, other questions from commissioners? I have a question. Um, you mentioned the floor system. Um, I didn't catch all of what you said when you first brought it up about going up to King County, and it sounded like you said this part was already acquired. Is that something you already have, and what are you using it for currently? Nothing. It's for a helicopter, it's so it's storage. sitting at his storage. <laughs> oh, yeah. okay. And yeah. Is that an example of we were saying other agencies had something you're in league with them they no longer use it and and then it ends up in your shop to use for other things the other sheriff agencies want to help their sheriff agencies the cameras, so. it's a it's forward looking infrared yeah. is what FLIR is you, know, you see those images of like a hot spot moving in the in the woods or something on on youtube videos it's they're able to look at heat differentiation the heat signature camera there's a there's a, actually a photograph in the packets that you have of what it looks like that's the top of a state patrol aircraft though. pictures in there is actually what the FLIR looks like is that donated to the county okay transferred from yeah a transfer to us okay. FLIR how do you spell it what is it F-L-I-R forward looking it. imaging infrared infrared forward looking infrared so basically a heat camera detects heat person runs into the forest it's a cold forest and 
there's a person at 98.6 degrees, it just shows up as a white signature. Or in the water, or... Yeah. Picture me here. Thank you. Um, my next question, I guess, is, is there a timing element to this? Is this like, you know, this is the deal now. If you know, if you don't do it during in the next third days, then the cell is gone, and and you don't have access to this. What, what is the timeline on this? Well, the we're we're basically in a queue. There's a, a whole bunch of agencies across the country that sign up to be in these queues. And my understanding, we've been in the queue for quite some time. Almost two years. About two years. Um, and I think we're pretty high up in the queue now, which means that it's very likely that at some point we're going to get a call and say, hey, one of these oh, is available for you. Um, but at that point in time, I, I don't know is that it's like, commissioners, we have to make a deal right this second. I think it's more of a, I wanted to brief you guys, give you guys an understanding officially of what it is we're looking to do. Um, and again, they're... At this point in time, there's no funding request attached to this. It would just be a contract between us and um, Helicopter Northwest. Northwest, Northwest Helicopters. <laughs> I'm going to say that backwards every time. I'm sorry, Brian. Now you've got to um, say Yeah. Uh, it would basically just be the, the MOU, the contract between us um, that outlines all of these things that we would then get over to you guys, and you guys would look it over, and we would we would basically need the Board of County Commissioners to sign off on the contract. That's but, not something you can do independently? No, all contracts have to come before the board, even like our school resource officer contract. And there's no request for money at this time. time. You're just looking for authorization. Yeah, because the reality is, is that if if we go in and come back with this insurance company and they say, well, actually, it's going to be $100,000 a month for insurance, then the program's likely dead right now. Um, I mean, it's just that's too much of a cost for us to absorb. Um, but when I was told it's going to be twelve to fifteen thousand, well, I can absorb a thousand dollars a month um, in insurance, and then the fuel piece, obviously, coming out of being able to prorate that out of our existing voter fund, which is very healthy right now, um, makes the entry cost of this extremely low. Is there like a fit, like when we, if we were to approve this, whatever it is that we have to approve, is there like a, like a corollary MOU that we could, I mean, because I don't know what people are imagining. You know, you said in your slides, like getting over the public fear. Uh, we, we dealt with this when the military vehicle was, yep. you know, was being acquired and we heard a lot from mm -hmm. the community. And, and I understood that to a point because, you know, a vehicle rolling through people's neighborhoods is different. You know, a helicopter, a little dinky helicopter, you know, d flying around, it's noisy, but it's like, it doesn't, it doesn't instill fear in me that, somebody you know of what's going on or whatever but but if they're you must have heard something because you've you kind of laid that out in one of your slides so i guess my question is since you've been really clear about here's what we're going to use it for could we kind of like spell that out so that then if whoever's imagining some other use is not going to worry about that it is in there um and i put it in the slide because i recognize that anytime you talk about the 1033 program and the yeah. surplus of military equipment um, you know, everyone starts thinking missile launchers and long wave, you know, x-ray machines that can zap people's eyeballs out. And most of what we get from the military are the IFAC medical kits um, that come with tourniquets and all those things. Yeah. Um, and we, at one point we had the armored vehicle, but it was extremely impractical, which is what led to ultimately the commissioners to purchase the Bearcat. And I think the biggest thing for all of this and what I've tried to do personally is just be transparent about the actual use of these items. Um, so I still deal with every day, oh, you know, you got this armored vehicle, but once you actually explain to people in detail what it's for, all of a sudden the, the kind of the, the irrational fear starts to dissipate a little bit of, you know, listen, we use these for barricaded suspects. Um, here's the threat matrix. Here's what it takes to actually get an armored call, an armored car to come to your call, right? You have to meet this, this threat matrix that we fill out every time. Um, and then once people recognize that we're using these for serious, serious felony crimes, um, or people who have made serious threats to harm others or harm us, um, then all of a sudden, you know, I think people come to a better understanding. And so I think that's going to be the same thing with the helicopter, is just clearly spelling out exactly what the uses are, which is in the PowerPoint. I've, I've listed out some of the things that, the, what it will be used for, and some of the things that it won't be used for. Yeah. Um, well, just, I mean, I don't know if it's worth putting that in some kind of document, but, because, you know, it seems like there's arguments or, you know, there's, 
argument about uses, whatever that is. There's arguments about money, right? But this isn't really costing very much money. You know, it's just a waste of money, as some people would say. You know, if, if it was going to be this big, you know, acquisition, yeah. three or four hundred thousand dollars, and what could we spend that money? And then there's like the that general thing that you alluded to, where people that don't like that program because it's like we shouldn't be militarizing our local law enforcement. It's a different function. It's a different, and that goes to like hiring, like you know, sure. hiring old military people versus the kind of training and connection to community that we'd like to see at local, you know, at this level. So anyway, those are kind of the three buckets of sort of complaint that you might get. I'm just trying to see how we can address those. Yeah. If you, if you don't let if you don't mind, I wanted to address the helicopter. The, the helicopter that we're personally talking about acquiring currently is actually a commercial helicopter that was actually purchased and used by the military. Mm -hmm. And then it's being surplus now. It's not a military, it's not a military asset. It just was used by the military. When it's in service, it looks like a civilian helicopter. It doesn't look like a military helicopter. It will never look like that. So the, the public will, it's to them, and it is a commercial helicopter, and that's the way it was born from the factory. So we're not talking about an armored car thing. It's a whole different story. Or even a Huey. Because I, I know a lot of people have the association of a Huey helicopter with, like, the Vietnam War. Um, when you see a photo of these of these it looks little like tiny new training helicopter, helicopters, it looks like some Apache. It looks like Ky Cairo 7's helicopter. Helicopters are flying all over this county all day and night yeah. already. But if they will not notice us, yeah. Yeah, trust me. And if you look at the uh, in the in the presentation, the orange and white, those are what they look like in that training mode. They're orange with a, a white stripe or white it's totally non-military. You never would go into that's, combat that's with how aircraft they look like that. And those, that's how they come to us or would come to us. It would be orange and white. Obviously, we'd probably go through a process that Northwest Helicopters would would paint it more of a, a, a different color than that. Um, but that's what they look like when they're used by the military, and then that's how they'll show up to us. Can, so you said Pierce County's got an airplane, but like, what's the closest county that has like this? King County. King County. King. And, and, and do they have stats they could give us on, you know, we spent, I don't know, they might not have the same arrangement we're gonna have, but they probably got stats to say, we saved this many lives and we spent this many dollars, and this is, so this is the dollar per life that we basically invested by using this. That could be something that public would like to see. Yeah, we can get that for you. I know that King County has a robust aviation program, actually, and, and that's what led to, I think, King County's old Guardian one is now sitting down at your airfield um, because they just purchased, what, a six and a half million dollar? It's 4.6 million is their new installment. 4.6 million dollar helicopter. Um, but you also open yourself up. I'm sure some of that is being paid for through grants and things like that. Um, it's pretty easy to get grant money for existing programs and to build on to those things. They have support of the city of Seattle, yep. fire department. There's a lot of funding that comes from these other organizations that help fund the helicopter program in King County. I have a couple questions if I yes, can sir. jump in. Yes, um, okay, so my questions are about the percentage of time that you um, assume this would be used for search and rescue compared to pursuit mitigation. Um, I see the numbers you have in here for water rescue calls in 2021. So I'm wondering if we have updated numbers for like 2022 or 23. Um, and then how would you prioritize the different uses? So like if you're on a search and rescue mission and then you get a high speed chase that you feel is really dangerous, how would you uh, prioritize those different kinds of calls if you're already using the helicopter? The first question, yes, Chief NC has actually had 2023 numbers, but I got busy and lost the whatever email he sent me. So I'm going to have him send you guys the email for the 2023 numbers. Okay. Uh, it just didn't make it in the PowerPoint. What were the old numbers that she was referring to? It's on the it's PowerPoint, on the, right? The, uh, you should see the, the water rescues. It'll be broken down by total and then by Nisqually River. Um, oh, at the first right. flight. Okay, gotcha. Sorry. And then the second question is, that's going to be a case-by-case -case basis. Um, you know, it. that's a tough one because I would say the – the pursuits don't usually last very long. They, you know, most pursuits only last like three or four minutes. Um, but in the event that we have an ongoing pursuit that's lasting, I could see the helicopter diverting to that um, because that's taking, you know, 15 minutes maybe out of out of their search and rescue area or search and rescue efforts, and then they can go right back to the search and rescue. Um, just because, again, I would. I would hate to have that asset up in the air while it's looking for a, a, a lost hiker in the woods, for instance, 
um, and then have a pursuit going on in the same area that they didn't divert to, that we didn't de-escalate, and then have a, have a safe capture of that person. But then I think when you look when you look at the circumstances, you know, what if that's um, you know a ten year old with mental health disabilities? Maybe the priority is more towards the search and rescue piece of that because time's of the essence. You don't want this person to fall into a creek or any, anything like that. So I think it's going to have to be a case by case basis on that and just evaluating the risk. I think um, what the sheriff really means is about saving lives. So we will always defer to. Who save someone's life first. That's the way it's always been in the past, and it's the way it always is with police aviation, is saving a life becomes the first thing, which whatever call that is, whether it's someone lost that's in the process of drowning that you can save, or whether there's a risk of someone driving through the middle of a school to get 100 miles an hour, these are the risks that you have to assess at the time. That makes sense. Um, would it be possible to see a cost breakdown that includes the costs to helicopter Northwest since this just says zero since a lot of it's donated? Um, I'd be curious to know what the costs are in general for this. So to understand like how much is being donated exactly what what the value is of that. Um, and then a question for potentially assistant county manager or county manager um, or maybe even share if you know, um, have we confirmed that the voter fund can be used for fuel and stuff when this is being used for operations over water? Do we know that that's accurate? Uh, I had not heard that that was part of the proposal, but we will certainly be looking into that. Okay. It um, is possible to use those for the the, the uh, program for the, the uh, marine <laughs> services. The Thurston County Sheriff's Office is the only one with an approved marine services program in Thurston County. Uh, but when we renew that contract, then that contract gets approved by um, by state parks. And once we have that in there, that would be, we still need that additional approval from them, but it is an authorized uh, asset for, for voter safety. So. Okay, thank you, you. And you've already done that research, you know that. I know that you can do use it for that. We just have not got that approval uh, for that program. We just have to write it into the next contract. Yes. It's not currently a service. From Lewis County, Mason County. Nobody else has anything like this for pickoff or search and rescue. And I, how, how would you handle mutual aid requests? Right now, I think we would stay internal as we build the program up and, and I guess, get our own successes in line. I, I would personally, and uh, I'll defer to Brian as well, but I, I think we had this conversation and came to the agreement like that they'd have to pay him for... For something yeah you outline now, some minimum, type of we would want to out. to keep it internal to thurston but again as the program builds you know we have put in requests to king to guardian one and things like that and they have come down here before um so i think it's just it's not usually very feasible when you're just starting to get something off the ground normally you want to keep it internal and, and work through your own your own process of starting up a new program um so right now i think we would keep it internal to Thurston County. And from the pilot's perspective, perspective, our experience level is this county. We know it. We know the places. We know a lot of it. Going to the other counties isn't going to be places that we know. We'd be at a, a disadvantage yeah. for us to do something like that. Without and this would be available for call, call us for like the USAR team or not. So it would be it would be open to things outside of specifically law enforcement. Well, it would depend on what the specific request sure. is. So yeah. if it's like a search and rescue type function yeah. or, you know, again, um, you know, we just had the, the high speed chase that went across the entire county and then backwards up I-5. Yeah. You know, that's a pretty good one to, especially for an assault one shooting suspect who paralyzed someone, that's a pretty good one to, to spin the helicopter up and get it running. Yeah. Um, like big, a big landslide. Uh, flooding and people are trapped in their houses and like these these are all things that we currently cannot respond to I think what we would probably do for something like that is reach out to the county manager and brief them and see if they if the county is willing to absorb that mutual aid cost um, knowing that other agencies would probably do the same thing for us so I think that's something we have to recognize and all of our mutual aid efforts is um, it's hard to just be the recipient all the time. Sometimes yeah. when you start new programs up, you may want to assist other other agencies and other counties who are experiencing, you know, earthquakes or whatever it is. Um, or even you know, Amtrak gets derailed over I-5 and they need assistance with something. Um, but I think for something like that, we would brief the county manager first. Okay, we're about out of time there for that. So if there's no other questions, we'll 
cut you guys loose. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is an executive session pursuant to RCW 4231101I to discuss with legal counsel representing the agency matters relating to agency enforcement actions or to discuss with legal counsel representing the agency litigation or potential litigation to which the agency governing body or member acting in an official capacity is or is likely to become a party when public knowledge regarding the discussion is likely to re result in an adverse legal or financial consequence to the agency. Lake Bottom Ownership. All right. <laughs> uh, 30 minutes. Everybody think we can handle this in 30 minutes? Travis, 30 minutes. Sound right? You're, you're muted. Yeah, so I, I think we can do it. I'm optimistic, Chair, uh, Commissioner. Okay, so 30 minutes is our estimate. Commissioner, action may follow. It is 9.39. We'll go till 10.10 10, uh, and extend if necessary. Pick up with the next topic.
Okay, um, we are back. Thurston County Board of County Commissioners work session, April 10, 2024. It's 10, 14 a.m. We are concluded item two on this morning's agenda and there is no board action following the executive session that we just completed. Next up is item three. It's a Legacy Forest Defense Coalition mapping discussion. Um, we have guests here and I'll have them introduce themselves when we go uh, around the, the table. I'm gonna set this item up for the public's benefit. We, um, Thurston County has been engaged in a multi-year effort to try to preserve the more uh, older stands of forest within Capital State Forest, that, which is the state forest land managed by the Department of Natural Resources. And we've had a difficulty in trying to uh, accomplish uh, what's have been a widespread community supported goals uh, in doing that. And we've had multiple different, um, we've had multiple different conversations with DNR in different places at different times on different issues. Most recently one, I believe in within three, a couple, three, a couple weeks ago, um, we, there's been new programs that have started and we've applied to be participate and not been uh, uh, accepted into those programs. So we've been, um, we've been taking attack of, um, as cuts come up before the Board of Natural Resources, we've been giving public comments, sending in letters, at least half a dozen. Um, some of those created temporary pauses, other ones were ignored. Um, most recently, we had a pause on a on a parcel of cabbage patch, which BNR, the Board of Natural Resources said, we'll give you till October to come up with a plan for what you intend to do with this particular parcel. Um, otherwise, we'll proceed. Um, we then had uh, in, in the letter that denied our, um, our in inclusion in the proviso from last legislative session, the DNR invited us to have a conversation with them. That's what led to the conversation last week. So we touched on a number of issues with them. So um, there's a number of different community groups that have been working uh, in the same direction that we've been working and um, you know, giving us information. So this is an opportunity for some of those groups um, to kind of present the board with some uh, additional information, supplementary information, contrary information, ideas about what a plan for Thurston County might look like if we were to want to propose one to the Board of Natural Resources. Um, that just to kind of hear from, I've been hearing from a lot of the folks here in this room, but uh, we have five commissioners. Um, unfortunately, Commissioner Edwards has a family emergency and Commissioner Klaus has a conflicting meeting, but this is all recorded and they'll be watching this. Commissioner Mejia is on Zoom and Commissioner Fournier and I are here. So we want to go through, we've got an hour to go through and um, let's start with introductions and then I'll turn it over to whoever's leading the, 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 the guests. So I'm Ty Menser and I'm the chair of the board and I um, will turn it to my colleague. I'm Wayne Fournier, I'm the vice chair of the board. Hi, good morning, my name is Leonard. I'm the county manager. Hi, Robin Campbell, assistant county manager. <coughs> Um, my name is Stephen Kropp. I'm director of the Legacy Forest Defense Coalition. Uh, I'm Joshua Wright, and I am programs director of Legacy Forest Defense Coalition. I'm Jim Oliver, South Sound Coordinator, Center for Responsible Forestry. I'm Vanessa Lavelle. I'm a graduate student in the Master's in Environmental Studies program at Evergreen. Good morning, everyone. I'm Miguel Perez Gibson. I'm here with uh, Legacy Forest Policy Advisor for Washington Conservation Action. I've been invited by Stephen to more background is needed, but I'll just say that um, boots on the ground forester, a little context with DNR, eventually managed the DNR's timber program back in the day and various positions since then, most recently working for the governor. I'm Cheryl Allblad, and I'm on the board with Legacy Forest Defense Coalition, and we appreciate your work and support, and um, just really want to get to the table with DNR and, and um, preserve the last legacy forests that remain, the last 4%. Okay, thank you thank for you. all for being here and helping to inform our, you know, um, work in this area. Um, none of us are forestry experts, so we can heavily rely on the information we've gotten from different community groups and 
So, Stephen, are you taking the lead then? To I am. Okay, yes. then we'll turn it to you. Okay. Thanks so much for having us. Um, I want to quickly introduce two folks that are not here today. Um, one is a forestry consultant that we've been working with. His name is Miles Lefer. He's got a master's degree in forest ecology from the Univers University of Washington. Um, over 10 years of experience doing contract work with universities, government agencies, and private industry. Um, he just completed some work for us in Grays Harbor County and will be assisting us with some economic forecasting and analysis and overall quality assurance associated with the capital state forest project. Um, and then there's Dylan Fisher, who's on, also on our board of directors um, and serves as a science advisor to the Legacy Forest Defense Coalition. He's a forest ecologist. Um, he's done a lot of research on relationships between plant diversity and ecosystem functions, um, like nutrient cycling and root dynamics, and the ability of forest ecosystems to adapt to changes in the environment, including climate change. Um, he's published dozens of papers in peer-reviewed journals and also teaches a number of classes in forestry ecology at uh, Evergreen State College. Um, <clears throat> I want to start by emphasizing that um, the proposal that we've developed for Capital State Forest is a draft proposal. Um, nothing has been finalized, and we're still working with county staff to evaluate the impacts of our draft proposal on taxing districts. Um, and we may recommend changes to the proposal based on um, our ongoing, ongoing conversations with the county, feedback we receive from the, from the community and the board, um, and also the results of Vanessa's work. Vanessa is doing her thesis uh, on Capital State Forest, and she'll, she'll talk a little bit about that um, in a few minutes. Um, also, I want to emphasize that um, our presentation today is focused only on the protection and restoration of the oldest and most biologically diverse forests that remain in capital state forests, um, which make up about, um, we're talking about native forests, so non-plantation non forests, um, make up about 20% of capital state forests. Our proposal says nothing about how the other 80% should be managed. And there are folks who, who are understandably have an interest in how that um, other 80% should be managed. Um, but uh, we're not, and, and Miguel may want to say something about that later. Um, but um, for today, we're just focused on the that 20% of native natural forests. Um, I also want to um, say a few words very quickly about um, the presentation that you were given a couple of weeks ago by DNR, DNR management staff. Um, a lot of things that were said that we believe were misleading or untrue. Um, we're here today to present the board with a new vision for Capital State Forest that we believe is consistent with DNR policies and legal obligations and the interests of the public which include, but are not limited to the forest products industry. Any, any questions about any of that? Thank you so much. I'll get into the presentation um, then. Um, so, uh, I, get, I should also preface this, this presentation um, by explaining that DNR has historically managed state forest lands for one purpose and one purpose only, and that is to produce timber. Um, they, of course, have to, uh, they're subject to certain constraints that are imposed upon them by the, their habitat conservation plan and the forest practices rules and the policy for sustainable forests. But DNR does not manage state forest lands for the purpose of storing carbon. They don't manage state forest lands for the purpose of protecting biodiversity or enhancing wildlife habitat. They manage the, our state forest lands to produce timber. Um, that's in the policy for, written into the policy for sustainable forests. And it, they, the agency has been operating under this assumption 
that the state constitution requires the agency to manage our state forest lands to maximize timber revenue. Um, the, the thing that I want to point out is that the, the state Supreme Court, in a ruling in 2022, turned that assumption on its head when it ruled that there essentially there is no mandate. And Dwayne um, alluded to this, Dwayne Emmons, um, when he spoke to the board a couple of weeks ago, when he said that, um, that DNR, the, the Supreme Court found that DNR is not required to maximize timber revenue. But um, the ruling by the Supreme State Supreme Court made it very clear that DNR is not required to harvest timber at all on federal grant lands. That they set the su sustainable harvest calculation and they determine, it's up to DNR to determine what's in the best interest of the beneficiaries, whether it's to manage land for, for timber revenue or recreation or carbon storage or something else. And um, the Board of Natural Resources recognized this in a resolution that was, a, in a unanimous resolution that was passed by the Board of Natural Resources, which is the governing body that establishes the policies under which DNR operates. Um, and this was just shortly after the Supreme Court decision, a few months later, in 2022. And the resolution that was passed by the Board of Natural Resources instructed DNR, and I'm, I'm reading now from the resolution, to explore the implications of incorporating additional objectives into the 2025 to 2034 sustainable harvest calculation. That's basically DNR's plan for managing state forest lands over the next 10 years. Um, incorporate additional objectives into that sustainable harvest calculation and the tactical plans, which lay out um, how that sustainable harvest plan is to be implemented, where to harvest and when, to include carbon storage, watershed protection, fish and wildlife habitat, ecological functions and values, carbon sequestration, and landscape structural diversity. So this is the Board of Natural Resources talking, not me. So, so there's been a recognition um, that uh, things have changed in, in light of the Supreme Court ruling. So I just, I wanted to mention that as context um, before I dive into our, our presentation. Um, in our presentation, um, I wanna focus specifically on a set of requirements that DNR, that are already enshrined in DNR's Habitat Conservation Plan and, and Policy for Sustainable Forests. So setting the Supreme Court decision aside, setting aside all of the other objectives, um, DNR is, is already required to meet certain stand structure objectives for their for the state forest um, lands. And this is very clear in the, as I said, in the Habitat Conservation Plan and their policy for sustainable forests and in the um, implementation, HCP implementation procedures, which DNR follows. <clears throat> Um, and I'm going to refer to some slides now. <clears throat> this is a table that outlines the uh, stand structure objectives. This is from the, the DNR's Habitat Conservation Plan. Um, as, as you can see, there are a number of objectives um, for meeting certain stand structure targets, which essentially means that um, the, the HCP envisioned that that DNR would manage the lands in such a way that a certain percentage of their land base would provide late successional habitat for species that are associated with, with late <coughs> successional forests. And then there would be um, other land stands set aside to provide habitat for other species that may be associated with other forest conditions. And, um, the objective, the idea was to, to manage their lands so at, at any given time, between 10 to 15 percent of the land base is fully functional, which is, um, which is basically old growth. It's old growth like forests. So forests that are 150 years or older is how it's defined in the HCP. Um, and that uh, at any given time, an additional 25 to 35 percent of the land base 
um, is, can, can be classified as structurally complex, um, which was defined in the HCP as forests that are 70 years old or older. And then there are, there are other objectives for, um, for younger forests, um, stand development stages that you can see in the table. Um, and these objectives, um, the, the HCP and policy for sustainable forests requires DNR to meet these objectives for each of six planning units. So, so the HCP divided Western Washington into actually nine planning units, um, six west side planning units plus three east side planning units. And uh, their DNR is required under the terms and conditions of their HCP and their policy for sustainable forests to meet those stand structure objectives within each of the west side planning units, each of the six west side planning units. Um, this is made clear um, throughout in many places throughout the HCP and uh, DNR policies and procedures um, and in the 1997 biological opinion for the Habitat Conservation Plan, um, which says that uh, the HCP includes commitments to provide certain percentages of stand structural classes from open forest to fully functional complex forests, and the timber harvest must be consistent with the goals and objectives of the HCP to develop and maintain these habitat types. So it's unambiguous um, that these are, are requirements and they're fundamental to, um, they underlie uh, virtually every aspect of the HCP and policy for sustainable forests. Um, so uh, I was curious when I, when I first started um, tracking DNR timber sales and, and learning more about DNR, how DNR lands are managed. Um, I learned about these objectives and was curious where they were in terms of meeting, how far along they were in meeting these objectives. And um, Andy Hayes, who was director of the DNR's Forest Resources Division at the time, this was three or four years ago now, um, to his credit, um, had his staff take a look at where, they, where they're at in terms of meeting these objectives at my request. And this is what they found. Um, if you look at this table, um, and this is looking at just one of those stand structure objectives, the fully functional stand structure objectives, that, that 10 to 15% fully functional stand structure objective. Um, what they found is they're currently in the South Coast Planning Unit, um, and the majority of Capital State Forest is located in the South Coast Planning Unit. They're currently at, at 0.1 percent, one tenth of one percent fully functional forest, um, and they won't get to ten the bare minimum of 10 percent until the year 2110. Um, in the South Puget Sound planning unit, part of the uh, part of Capital State Forest is um, the north part is in the South Puget Sound planning unit, they're currently at 0.9% fully functional forests. And they won't reach that bare minimum of 10% until between 2080 and 2090. So there are... Well, one thing I'd also like to note is that in, in DNR's calculations, um, they're counting areas that are currently within planned timber sales in some cases. So when you, when yeah. you, we've done public disclosure requests to see, okay, where is that 11% in the South or in the uh, South Puget planning unit in 2090 going to be? And they have shape files of shit. So show here's what we're counting. And what we found is that because of data inaccuracies, a lot of the time, especially when you're talking about riparian buffers, because that's most of what they use to get to this number, um, timber sales will be planned within the areas that they're currently counting towards the HCP. So even if you, you know, assume that these numbers are accurate, you know, know that a lot of the forests in that that are being counted in there are actually in planned timber sales. So even, even with this accounting, they're still falling short. Yeah. Good point. Um, so this, uh, this next slide shows a pie chart, which is a graphic representation of the chart that I just showed you for the South Coast planning unit. 
And um, this is looking at um, structurally complex forests. So the um, um, actually the last uh, uh, the last slide showed fully functional forests. So this slide is showing um, structurally complex forests as a pie chart rather than a table. Um, where they are in terms of meeting that second objective of providing 25 to 35 percent structurally complex forests in each planning unit. And this, again, is looking at just the South Coast planning unit. And this is based on DNR's own analysis. This is not our data. What they found is that just 1 percent, they only have 1 percent protected structurally complex forests um, currently in the South Coast planning unit. There are other lands that are excluded from commercial timber harvest, but they're all younger forests. According to DNR, they don't meet the criteria for um, structurally complex forests. Um, and a total of 63% of their land base in the South Coast Planning Unit, again, these are DNR's own numbers, are currently um, fully available for commercial timber harvest. And another note I would make there is in the conservation areas with younger forests, they would be counting, again, riparian buffers and unstable slopes, which yeah. when it actually comes to planning out a timber sale, a lot of that 36% are actually going to end up being harvested. So some of those will be natural areas and areas that are actually preserved. Some of them will be buffers that are actually going to be left as buffers. And then some of them will be areas that DNR accounts for as buffers or unstable slopes that in the end will end up being included in timber harvest. Yeah, oh, that's an important point. Over 80% of that green slice of the pie chart, that 36% of other areas that are conserved are actually stream buffers. Which, um, you Does know, we're- Does anyone police the stream buffers and the riparian areas that should be protected? Yeah, so stream buffers serve many important functions and it's important to have those there, but they're not forests. They were never intended to provide the kind of habitat that species that are associated with late successional forests require. Um, they're, by definition, narrow, long strips of trees along streams. They're subject to all kinds of edge effects, and they don't come anywhere close to providing the kind of habitat conditions that we find in the legacy forests that some of you have seen and that we're um, working to try to protect. So good point, Joshua. <laughs> Um, so this is a, a um, graphic representation um, that shows um, exactly what we were talking about in the last slide, which is the, where DNR has, um, this is basically DNR's conservation plan for Capital State Forest, it's, it's stream buffers. And <clears throat> the, the blue areas show the stream buffers, and then the dark purple areas are those areas that DNR um, has determined are structurally complex. So this is that, uh, if you add all those dark purple areas together for the entire South Coast planning unit, again, Capital State Forest is just part of the South Coast planning unit, they come out to about 1% of their land base. That's those, those purple areas. And they're almost all stream buffers. Um, DNR also projected out into the future what these forests, what these stream buffers would look like 30, 40, 50 years from now. <clears throat> That's how they arrived at the, um, the predictions for fully functional forests. And um, this is what they're predicting the capital state forest will look like um, in 20, the year 2040. So they're assuming everything will be harvested, will be logged, except those those areas, those trees that are contained within the stream buffers. Um, and there are, there are um, as you would expect, as the trees get older, more of those um, stream buffers um, begin to develop the characteristics of structurally complex forests, even though we wouldn't really call them forests. DNR is, is taking credit for them as fully functional, counting towards that fully functional objective. <coughs> And one of the reasons I'm um, spending so much time on this slide is DNR has, has not mapped structurally complex forests outside of conservation areas, what they would call conservation areas, which include stream buffers. So they've mapped 
um, because they're they're interested in, in um, or Andy Hayes was interested in how far along they are towards meeting those targets that we discussed earlier. Um, they did map structurally complex for us within the stream buffers, but not outside of the stream buffers. So we had to do that work ourselves. And um, these are the structurally complex forests that were modeled by DNR. And this is our model of structurally complex forests, again, looking only at the stream buffers. So I show this to compare um, our... There was three slides, right? There was now, there was projected, and then there's your assessment? Right. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> Yeah, so I'm flipping back between DNR's um, uh, model and ours. You can see that they're very similar. So we're um, this give us gives us confidence in our model and our ability to um, identify and map those structurally complex forests. The fact that. Our results for the for the conserved areas of the stream buffers and other areas um, are very close to the results that DNR came up with. So um, we've taken this a step further and actually modeled uh, structurally complex and mapped structurally complex forests outside of the stream buffers in Capital State Forest, and that's what this map shows. <clears throat> We're estimating that there are um, approximately 5,454 acres of unprotected structurally complex forests, so that's outside of the stream buffers, um, currently in capital state forests. Um, and another... That includes Grays Harbor site? That includes the Grays Harbor site, yes. This, this map is not just the... This in county, you can see the dotted line at the top and then it does a cheek jag. So it's about the right side's Thurston County and the left side's, you can see yeah, most of it. I on, see, yeah, okay, I see Most of the reds on the Thurston sees. side, but there's a few scraps on the Grace Harbor side. I'll have a slide later that shows just the Thurston County side. Um, and then we took that map and um, because there are so few of these legacy forests left, um, and because DNR is so, so far behind in meeting their stand structure objectives, um, we took a, a more, a broader look at um, all of the forests and capital state forests and the state they're in and um, looked at recommending um, other areas that we thought would be suitable to be managed um, to work towards achieving those other stand structure objectives. And that's what this map is showing. Um, Joshua and I spent a lot of time on this. Um, Jim uh, Oliver, um, who's sitting next to Joshua here, helped with um, validation and uh, has spent a lot of time um, walking a lot of these forests out in the field. So there's a lot of a lot of work that went into this map. And. Um, I'm going to pause here and see if Joshua wants to say anything more about how we selected those or mapped those those areas that we're recommending for restoration and protection. Explain what the green really means. Yeah, so the the red areas are areas that are already in a specific, at least in the beginning of being structurally complex. A lot of the a lot of the green areas are also somewhat structurally complex, but might not meet the threshold of being deemed a fully you know. A, a, kind of passing the bar of, you know, maturation one, which is what DNR often refers to as, you know, structural complexity. So um, what Stephen said at the beginning, 20% of capital state forest is natural forest. Um, but on this map, we're only talking about, uh, I don't have a number off the top of my head, but I think about 5% of the forest that's actually structurally complex in capital state forest. So there's still that other 15% of broadly old natural forests. So these are forests that were likely cut in the 1940s or 30s. Um, and they're also naturally regenerated, but they aren't as old as some of these that were cut in the 1920s or 1910s. Um, so it includes a lot of those forests, not all of them. In fact, it leaves some of those available for harvest when you know, you're know you looking at smaller isolated blocks. Um, and then it also includes areas between certain legacy forest reserves that are um, 
plantation forest that should be managed for restoration when you're um, one of the conversation items with DNR has been, uh, and as you know, that there aren't any big chunks in capital state forest and DNR likes to repeat that, that, you know, they're just small fragments here and there. So the idea behind these restoration areas is creating larger chunks. So taking areas between existing structurally complex forests, even if they are younger, you know, in some cases, these green areas are clear cuts. Broadly, they're, they're older native forests, um, but there are clear cuts involved where, you know, areas that we'd recommend be managed for restoration. So in, in a management scheme of these lands, we would recommend um, that those red areas are managed as conservation zones first and foremost, and that the green areas are managed first and foremost as restoration zones with the goal of, of bringing those areas, recruiting those areas into a fully functional um, interconnected ecosystem in capital state forest. And that goes a lot towards the ecosystem connectivity aspect of it. Yeah. So you're not just preserving these little bits, but you're preserving the landscape. Yeah, and I'd like Vanessa to talk a little bit about that. Um, yes, let me sir. skip this slide for now. So we're very excited to have Vanessa um, on our team. She's a graduate student, as she mentioned, at Evergreen State College. Um, she decided to do her master's thesis on Capital State Forest. And she's specifically looking at wildlife. Um, and we're very much interested in, and this, uh, this may inform the work that we're doing um, and those areas that we're recommending for protection and restoration. Um, we're very much interested in how wildlife use capital state forests, um, how they're distributed across the forest, if there are certain areas that, that the animals tend to use more than others. And also, we're um, very interested in how animals migrate through capital state forests. Are there certain routes that um, different animals prefer and are there conditions within capital state forests that either impede or facilitate that movement of animals um, through capital state forest? So I'm going to pause and let Vanessa talk a little bit. So I'm going to get out of the way of the image on this side, I guess. Um, this is actually from Co Conservation Northwest, which um, they were instrumental in creating a large um, Washington wildlife habitat connectivity working group. It's actually been around in some form since 2007. And so they um, they did the amazing overpass in I-90. It's actually a series of overpasses. I'm not sure if any of you have gotten a chance to see it, but elk can cross. They have pronghorn sheep and cougars. All kinds of animals are now able to cross over I-90. So now there, there is an agency turning their attention to I-5. And I-5 has been identified as a major barrier to wildlife movement, and they and many other agencies that make up the Washington Wildlife Working Group for Habitat Connectivity. Um, so there's already a property owner here at this site um, that is working I think, um, with Conservation Northwest on trying to improve this. They're, they're also going to do one at Castle Rock and one just south of Chehalis. And so when I saw this image when I was thinking about what to study, I thought, oh my gosh, I'm right here. I live in Capitol Forest. I live underneath the class dismiss proposed cut. Um, and, you know, I walk there every Saturday with my kids. It's a huge part of why we love living there so much. And there was actually like a salmon in our stream this year in Beatty Creek for the first time since I lived there, which was thrilling. Um, so I felt like I was, you know, we're part of this, um, healthy forest is what it feels like. So it was pretty interesting to hear that that's something that they want to prioritize logging. So I reached out to Conservation Northwest and said, you know, I saw this graphic. Do you have data on wildlife in Capital State Forest? And they said they, they don't. And so they sent me wildlife cameras, which I've installed. If you want to go to the next slide, I think. And um, the, um, so I have 10 cameras throughout Capital State Forest, and I picked legacy forest parcels because of a control. You know, they have um, the most complexity, and they host the most of biodiversity, as opposed to some of the plantation stands. So um, in looking at this, you know, we do have resident elk herd. We have black bears. We have, you know, a lot of deer. But there's also, you know, like I said, salmon is one of the species they're interested in. And then Conservation Northwest is also interested in fostering, in, because of climate change in particular, animals being able to move when they need to, from the Cascades to the Olympics, from the coast up to higher elevations, so that they can appropriately respond to temperature shifts. 
weather events, natural disasters. And um, so I think it is really compelling work. I get a lot of value out of the forest, but there are still wildlife, even though I think a lot of people think of Capitol State Forest as close to very urban centers. And, you know, we talk, they talk about it as being a working forest, which makes it seem like it's a place for people, but it's definitely a place for wildlife too. Thanks so much, Vanessa. Yeah. How much time do we have left? So we're supposed to wrap up your part by 11, but you started, started a little late. Yeah, we're so. going to go to 11.15. Yeah. Where we want to need that. It's 10.50. Uh, you got the clock clock clock's up here. Oh, OK. So you got, <laughs> we got 25 minutes total. All right. Including questions or whatever else we need. All right. Well, I'll, I'll try to go through these last few slides quickly. Um, the last series of slides really um, address the um, the impacts of our proposal on the beneficiaries. So there are, the county does, as you know, receive revenue from DNR from the sale of timber in capital forests, um, as do other um, state beneficiaries. And there will be, um, if our proposal were to be adopted, there would be a short-term impact, and I want to emphasize the word short-term, <laughs> short-term impact to the beneficiaries, the taxing districts, the counties, um, and the um, federal grant trusts. So um, this is, uh, again, just a, a graphic a representation of the map that I showed you earlier, um, where we've identified roughly 5% of capital state forest um, that we're recommending um, as protected areas, another 9% that we're recommending be managed um, as restoration areas. 27% of capital state forest is in riparian reserves. Those are those stream buffers that we saw earlier. Um, and then the rest is currently is available for um, and, and could be uh, under our proposal in the future available for commercial harvest. Um, this, this chart is looking at um, marketable <coughs> timber, and this is just on the Thurston County side of Capital State Forest. So this shows the total um, number of board feet, and this is all data that we obtained from DNR. Um, and how that's, how many board feet are within um, the areas that we're, uh, of marketable timber, and we, uh, we define marketable timber for this exercise as trees that are 30 years old or older. So trees that will be ready to, har to harvest within the next 10 years. Um, and you can see the breakdown of how many board feet there are. About half the board feet are in areas that are outside those areas that we're recommending for protection and restoration. Um, this is just showing those numbers that on a map. So the the, um, again, the areas that we're recommending for restoration protection are in red and green. And then the, the light brown um, or orange areas are those, um, it says harvestable, but they're, that, those are the marketable um, board feet. And then the, all the white areas are, are areas that have been recently logged. Um, if we look at um, the total planned timber harvest in Capital State Forest, this is all of Capital State Forest. They're about, DNR is planning um, to harvest over the next um, 10 years, roughly. This is all planned timber sales. They plan their timber sales out five to 10 years in advance. Um, currently, they have plans to harvest about 204 million board feet in Thurston County, on the Thurston County side of Capital State Forest. And um, this is just a map of all of those timber sales. And you can see that they're, from this map, they are targeting um, the, those areas that we're recommending to a large extent for protection and restoration. Um, and this is showing that, um, that 200 and, and uh, 204 million board feet broken down um, by category. 
So how many board feet, again, are in the areas we're recommending for protection and restoration, and how many are outside of those areas? Um, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on these slides. This, this is just a, uh, a map of all the different trusts on the Thurst, uh, in all of Thurston County. Um, this is a breakdown of how many acres are contained within each one of those trusts. So the thing to notice about this chart is that um, the large majority of state trust lands in Thurston County are managed to generate, primarily to generate revenue for the county. So that forest board repayment, um, forest board purchase lands, about a quarter of the revenue from timber harvest that occurs on those lands goes to the county and the, and the taxing districts. Um, the forest board transfer lands, three quarters of the revenue that's generated from harvested timber on those lands goes to the county. Um, there's 22% of the acres are common school lands. Um, common school lands, Chris Reichdahl, the director, the superintendent of public instruction has said that, that uh, OSPI neither wants or needs that money and that we prefer to see the money that's generated from timber harvest on common school lands go to the counties. Um, all of the other federal grant trusts together, um, the capital trust, uh, the money that goes to the prisons and the hospitals, um, all the university trusts all together add up to about the, uh, 8%. So I, I just, Obviously, your mapping's based on the trees on the ground, not all these overlapping trusts. And there's this repayment, you know, that, that's another, like, layer of defense that we keep hearing from DNR. And I'm just wondering how your proposed plan connects to that shield of the trust repayment that DNR says we cannot voluntarily choose to not harvest those lands or else we have to repay them. Yeah. So it's, it's important to, to understand that the money that DNR owes um, is, there, is owed to the state, to the state beneficiaries. So that's money that goes to the, would go to the legislature and then the legislature doles out that money to um, various departments and programs to fund, um, you know, for example, there's $7 million earmarked to, put, to install a new, sky, a new skylight in the legislative chambers in Olympia, um, there's money that's earmarked to um, fund improvements to the state prisons. There's a small uh, amount of money that goes to the universities, but most of that uh, um, repayment money goes to the state. And um, I don't, Miguel, do you want to, to talk about that a little more? Because Miguel's got a lot of history and I think understands this better than I do. Yeah, I think, I think, uh, your last presentation, Dwayne, kind of went over the trust repayment piece of it. I think, uh, Commissioner, you brought up the idea of an audit in the 23rd period. Um, I think for the present day and time, um, it would be helpful if the DNR was able to determine how many of those acres have yet to be harvested out of the original escapes my mind now. I think it was, I forgot how many acres, but anyway, um, so those acres, the timber rights, a third of the timber rights on those lands, not all of the timber rights, uh, was uh, retired, was transferred to those federal um, beneficiaries. So it may well be that on any particular timber sale that you may have concern, um, DNR could look up um, whether or not that you know what the uh, revenue is uh, with respect to uh, would go with that third say it was a three million dollar sale and there was a million dollars that was to go to the um, federal the beneficiary um, DNR could elect to transfer that money directly from the forest development account as cash to common school or whatever the particular beneficiary would be I think the major question here would be to determine how many acres are, have yet to be harvested of that full amount and whether at this point, and if there's enough funds in the forest development account 
to actually cash out the federal beneficiaries so that uh, you could get on with the management of those lands. There is a reversion every time uh, one of these Trust 42 parcels is logged. Uh, once that happens, it is reverted back to you. So it's under your management. So I think it's in your best interest to determine how much is left of that original um, transfer and uh, of the of the lands that we are interested um, of the sales that are coming up in the next year um, you know which one of those are under trust 42 and to what extent um, could uh, the federal beneficiary be um, reimbursed from the FDA or modifications in the sale itself that would uh, change um, harvest within a particular parcel I think uh, the, the main point here is there is flexibility uh, with the Department of Natural Resources and Thurston County to work together. It's not as if they are uh, totally boxed in. It's to the extent they want to use their discretion and how they want to explore finding you know, resolutions. I think the way it was presented to you was we're mandated to, to uh, cut these and we, there's no other option. It felt to me like at that meeting that they didn't wanted to use their discretion to work with us. I mean, uh, yeah. I think they, I think, really think you're right, they could, and that's what I was trying to press them on, but. Yeah, and as who, the. Who are the ones that have discretion? I'm not sure that the ones that were sitting in front of us are the ones that have the discretion either. Like, who has the discretion? Well, ultimately, the department, just like Thurston County, is, is run by elected officials. You are, right? Yeah. So as you have discretion, so does the Commissioner of Public Lands. But the functionaries the legislative don't direction. necessarily have the discretion. They, they, they themselves would need direction, correct, to be saying, I'd like you to pursue looking at scenarios that, in particular, sales. And there may be, and again, this is not for the whole holdings of Trust 42 that remain st still ob obligated to the timber um, rights uh, transfer. There may be just particular sales that are on, as Josh has pointed out, I think they're, they're on the docket to be harvested in the next year, two or three. That may be as far out as you even want to go. Let's just, we just want to look in the near term we expect things might change in the next year or two anyway. So the sales that you have queued up that are Trust 42, would like to know what they are, what the revenue impact is, and whether or not there would be the ability for the forest development account to transfer money. I'm just pointing out that it's like a second layer, right? Like we could present this plan and they could say, they could either say, well, we don't really like that plan and we don't agree with you and we're not going to do that. Or they could say, that's a pretty good plan, but we can't do it because we'd have to take this, they'd have to agree to this extra step of figuring out can, you know, what acres are left to be harvested, can they, can, I mean, what you just described. I mean, that'd be another layer. Those are two separate ways that they could say no. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> there's, it's, if, there, if there's a willingness, yeah. there's a way. And, yeah. Anyway, I just, I'm not trying to derail you. I just wanted to kind of throw that out there because yeah. that's what well, we've heard the last it's couple of times. important question. I mean, our... Part of our job, the task that we've taken on, is to demonstrate to the county and to DNR that there is a way. Yeah. We're, we're confident that there is, and um, we believe that the, the reason we're in, the reason we're all sitting here is because DNR has made a choice, a conscious, a discretionary choice to target specific stands for commercial harvest. There's no policy, there's no law, there's no plan, there's no procedure that requires DNR to do this, or even encourages DNR to pri prioritize the oldest and most biologically diverse and carbon dense forests for commercial harvest. In fact, their policies encourage and require them to do just the opposite. Um, and in terms of the forest board repayment lands, it's not as if there's a deadline that DNR has to, that they're trying to meet this debt to the federal grant trusts, or that there are gonna be consequences to the county um, if they don't, you know, if they don't harvest all of these repayment lands within a certain period of time. Um, DNR has complete discretion to set their sustainable harvest targets. 
um, they have discretion to, to determine how those sustainable harvest targets are met and where and when timber sales are, are scheduled within capital state forests. This is all at DNR's discretion. And they're, they're driven by commercial decisions, yes. right? It's, right? So when they're looking at these older forests, they're more valuable dollars-wise. Well, and then the consequences, you say there's no consequences. To, the consequences would be like such and such school district so puts pressure on them to say, hey, we're not getting the money that we were expecting. Well, yeah, but the point is it, it doesn't have to be that way <laughs> because there are plenty of forest board repayment lands, plenty of forest board transfer lands that are managed on behalf of the county that are, not, that are outside of these areas that we're focused on. That we're recommending for protection and, and restoration. So when, when you say county, do you mean county like he says the word county, as in this specific organization? Yes. Or do you say it county collectively and you're including the, con the, the junior taxing districts? I'm districts. including the taxing districts. So when you say right. county, you're saying our local recipients. Everyone within the county, yes. not just That's right. this yes. organization sitting in front right. of okay. yep. Versus like it going off to a university. University of Washington or I just want to put a finer point on what, what you said, Stephen. Um, I'm way uh, in this transfer right. There is a time period uh, in 1990 when these transfer rights were made to the federal trust. It was an 80 year. If they don't harvest them within 80 years, then it does automatically revert to the county. But the other uh, piece of this conversation would be conversations with the recipients, which would be for instance, Superintendent of Public Instruction, Chris Rechtal, who's already sort of mentioned that they're not in dire need for the, these funds to um, not necessarily have a timeline that would determine, you know, that these particular sales need to happen today. So although the uh, Washington State Superintendent of Public Instruction, who does pass money down to our local schools, may not be... Um, expressing a need for these funds. The funds also flow directly to our school districts and they have expressed the need for no, the funds. Thank you. So Chris Reichdahl doesn't speak for Rochester School District. So this is an important thing that DNR, I think, confuses a lot. Um, there is a difference between the Common Schools Trust and the money that goes to Rochester. So those, the, the money from, um, the money that the county receives from 25% on state forest board purchase or lands and um, and 75% uh, on uh, on state forest board transfer lands, that money goes to the county and then is distributed um, <laughs> to the junior taxing districts in the same way that your property tax bill would be distributed. So most of that goes to whatever school district the timber's harvested in. But what we're talking about here is the federal grant trust uh, in terms of what uh, Chris, uh, Chris Reichdahl oversees. And that money entirely goes to a fund called uh, the SCAP fund. Um, so that money um, is entirely earmarked for school construction projects statewide. And in order to get any of that money, a local school district has to pa pass a bond. And they would be getting money from that general fund, which is a statewide fund. So it, you know that, that wouldn't have, having less money in that fund um, wouldn't actually impact a local school district much at all. Uh, partly because that fund is required to be set at a certain amount, so anything that doesn't get in there from the uh, from timber harvests is required is added on top of at the legislature. So that money is essentially supplemental, and I believe all timber revenue made up something like was it eight percent of that fund. Um, so it's a so the common schools fund does not translate to oh the school district gets a bunch of money. It translates to it goes to a general fund that's earmarked for school construction and uh, school. Districts can act so as that fund. Through a bond. fund. Right, but, but then it gets taken for if it doesn't get put in there, it gets taken from somewhere else. Well, let me just to make it. I'm going to try and make it. It's it's complicated. Let me see if I can simplify. Very it. Complicated. <laughs> let's, let's simplify it. All right. So generally speaking, uh, common school trust, the federal trust, that money goes into a capital fund for capital right. construction. The, just the, the context here, it only represents about 0.01 or 0.02% of, what, of that, what that fund needs. That's why the superintendent of public instruction is saying it, it, it really doesn't play a bigger role. I'll, now, put that aside for a minute. This is where it gets a little bit fuzzy. 
why your school districts are saying, well, wait a minute, that affects us, is that if a particular um, sale, that is a federal sale, takes place in their school district tax area, then they do get a percentage of that sale as they would in any other of how you exactly. distribute taxes. So that's that's the difference that we all need to keep. We, we kind of mix those things together. And so they have a legitimate yes, voice, they do. but it's on a sale by sale basis and it has to fall within their school district. And that's why in Rochester in particular has been affected by that one because of where the it, yeah, it's fall within paused. their district or fall within the trust lands that are designated to them. I think it has to fall within you know this better than I, I think. Their taxing but, jurisdiction. Because I thought there was yes. there was a patchwork yeah. of lands no, all over exactly right. yeah. And and we have multitude of taxing jurisdictions. Maybe a little bit of that, but they're each there's, different school. There's district. actually right. a place. That's what I was railing against at the yeah. recent meeting. Like I think it's insane that it's like place based. Right. Like, yeah. You actually cut trees that are in that district, and then they yeah. get a bunch of money. Yeah, if you're in Clallam County, where there's a bunch exactly. of stuff. Like, exactly. It doesn't even, like, yeah. you know, we talked about the unitary trust as being right. yeah. not a solution, but at least a little more rational system yeah. for dealing, if you're going to deal with timber, and uh, the whole place-based thing is just crazy. Right. Some places, that's, so, that's the only money they're going to be getting because there's no property taxes. There's no, you know, you go to King County, and there, there's tons of money. The tax base isn't the same, yeah, right? Yeah. It's their percentage of property tax is the rate. We've got about five minutes just to time check on you guys. The rate is not so we'll the same you know. in all of them. You can follow up more on this round if you want. We'll yeah. see them yeah. again unless they go to a national park. California's already ruined. Oregon's already ruined. Washington is our evergreen state. This is all we got. So we have about five more minutes. So. Tangled web. We have, whoa. So it's gone. There's no money. So what's more valuable? So let me just give a quick example, which may, <coughs> may or may not help clarify this. Um, you're all familiar with the carrot timber sale. This is a timber sale that the county had requested DNR postpone um, because it, it does contain, I think everyone agrees, contains structure complex forests. Um, if this timber sale were to, were to go up for auction, it would, um, our best estimate would generate about um, five hundred thousand dollars for the county. So, um, so it's estimated the value is about two two million dollars. And because there's a mix of repayment and the purchase lands in that sale, the county would wind up getting about five five hundred thousand. So, and the payments to the county are, are generally spaced out over a period of one to two years. Um, so if we were to defer harvest to the carrot timber sale as we're proposing to do, it would create that temporary arrearage to the county of $500,000. But um, because the majority of forest board transfer and, and purchase and repayment lands are actually located outside of areas that we're recommending for restoration and protection. Um, that debt to the county could be paid back over time uh, relatively easily as other timber sales are scheduled in other areas that are not prioritized for protection or restoration. And then over the long term, the idea um, would be to look for other sources, other alternatives to logging to our reliance on these these legacy forests to generate revenue for the county. And there are many other alternatives. Um, but in the short term, um, there are ways of getting around this by scheduling other timber sales in areas that are that are lower priority habitat. Does, I don't know if that does that help. So are you suggesting that these timber sales in other areas would still be within Thurston County? Yes. So then the question becomes, and this is one of the questions that DNR has asked us to answer when we put a plan forward, is the impact on the junior taxing jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. So this brings us back to the conversation we were just having about if it's here, then Rochester School District gets a share of it. But if it's over here, they have lost out. So how do we address that? 
we're, we're looking at that with the county. With, we're working with county staff right. to take a, a detailed look at that. Thank you. And we will have all of those numbers for you. I don't have them right now. What, I, I'm just confused about the third bullet. Debt to county is paid back over time. So paid back with yeah, somebody else's that. money that then, then they're getting $500,000 right. uh, or less. I mean, at, at a certain point, you're... Well, no, it's all the same trust. It's all coming out of the same pot. So there, it is complicated um, because, you know, different parcels are located in different districts and the, their districts overlap each other. Um, so and there's di like different layers of repayments. So the, the information we got from DNR is saying that, that the timber sales uh, account for 11.3, no, $11,355,558 within not just the county. I, when, you can, when you say county, it confuses me. Because when we say county, we're not talking about the journey, junior taxing districts. They're, we have no say over what they want, what they don't want. But we also are expected to like think about them here and there, even though we're not, you know, directly responsible for or in or in control of. But you know, th that's a lot of money. It's scary. I would also add that um, for the county, when we think just about thirteen county government, um, when we prepare our budget, we treat timber revenue as windfall. So for the county to lose out on the revenue, that's not a big concern to me. The bigger concern is the junior taxing jurisdiction. If I could just jump in, I know we're out of time, but I think there's, um, we're stuck kind of in an either or sort of frame of mind here. And I think there's a third way that has yet to be explored, um, which is how these, how these lands are actually managed. Uh, generally, the issues around how the current civil cultural treatment of these forests is based on sort of a clear-cut model. Um, there's other ways to looking at managing the lands in a Rochester school district that may not involve a clear-cut and still, and still produce revenue. Yeah. It may involve more of a thinning. Uh, it may involve, instead of selling um, stumpage, you, you actually contract log it and sell logs to particular uh, uh, interested mills and get uh, more value for your volume. What I'm trying to point out in this two minutes I have is that the way of approaching this problem is sort of dichotomous and not really looking at it from the multiple possibilities that are out there if you so chose as a leader to look at creative solutions. So you're not pitting Rochester school kids against clear cuts. I mean, that's not the way to, that's not how we ought to be framing this. I, I completely agree with you, and I'm sure that the board does as well, especially as our board has approached DNR with those alternative approaches to timber harvest, and DNR has rejected them. And so I think there's contrary, more work to do. It's contrary to their own policies. Yep. In the Pasolo Fear Sustainable Forest, it actually states that DNR will manage um, activities to enhance the older forest targets in the HCP, that they'll use biodiversity pathways. So there's nothing that's required of DNR. No statutes, no laws have even changed. It's a matter of taking the leadership and to implement choice. what they have the authority to do today. And in, in the short, ter short term, when we talk about replacing timber revenue, what basically we're saying is that there is enough inventory volume across but generally well dispersed. If you look at the that, there's a slide in there that only shows the Thurston County side. And it shows where the marketable timber is across that, and it's pretty much it's pretty well represented across each trust. Each trust does have younger forests that could be logged. It's just that there's a short term, um, you know, it's going to take DNR a year to plant those timber sales, maybe two. So DNR has to make that shift. But there is enough volume there to um, to have have a source of timber that isn't it from these lands in the short term. Commissioner Mejia, I want to, we're out of time, but since you're, I just want to make sure you get any question answered that you might have. Um, I think my questions can wait, but I, I have appreciated the conversation that's taken place this whole time. Thank you again so much for coming. I'm sorry I couldn't be in person today, uh, but uh, I, I did enjoy the presentation and um, I, I can reach out with some of my questions um, 
maybe later today by email. I'd like to provide you, Robin and Leonard, with the, the statutes that provide the opportunity to pay these direct um, amounts from the FDA to the RMCA, so you have those. You've got a, a board of county commissioners that is ready to listen and hear what you're saying and is interested in, you know, these efforts and looking for alternatives. I mean, you've, it's so like there's an element of like, like you're kind of like, is this preaching to the choir? And because we have no say in what DNR does, we can help push them and prod them and annoy them. But like they're, they, sh you know, they, they dodge everything. And so like, what, you, what is what are you all doing to meet with them? Are they speaking with you? Are they listening to you? Do you get to go give this presentation to the people that are that, that have the discretion? Because we don't. And then the folks that were before us, I don't know that they do either. Like, so how do they give you guys the time of day? Well, uh, Washington Conservation Action, we meet with the Board of Natural Resource members. We're in dialogue with them now about the next sustainable harvest calculation. Uh, there was a resolution recently passed, or no, maybe a year ago, that asked DNR to start looking at alternatives to different rates for net present value, other civil cultural regimes that they could use. So there's a willingness there on the board okay. to start looking at these things differently as well. And there's an election coming. That's well, that's the elephant or donkey in the room, however you want to look at it. <laughs> Yeah, I would encourage the community who's out there listening to this and has weighed in and has helped drive the Board of County Commissioners in Thurston County's policies and, you know, actions in this arena to look to take the Commissioner of Public Lands election very seriously this year because there's stark differences between the candidates on these very issues. All right, we've got it. We're out of time, guys. Thank, Thank you so you. much for coming in. Thank nice meeting you. you guys. Thank you so much. Is it three? Is it two days up? I think there's several. Uh, Rebecca Soldania, Kevin Vandaway, and Jamie Earl. And there's the there's a Macaw tribal member. And I still forget his there. name, but I met Patrick. him. Patrick. Yeah. Oh. He's still in there. So there's a there's seven. Five. I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Thomasina. That'll be narrowed down. Ever there's probably there like could be a dozen we haven't even heard of yet. Nice. <laughs> Hi, how are you? Well, thank you for being here today. I just wanted to take this moment to. What was this your jacket? I wanted to take a moment to say hello and know the know the man behind the email. <laughs> Are we taking a five? Can we take a five minute break? Yeah, let's take okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.
Okay, it is 11.26 a.m. We're back uh, to finish up our work session for this morning, April 10th, 2024. We're, we're uh, down to item four, which is a broadband update. And see, we have Mike from Squally and Jenica, Economic Development Manager. So, Jenica, you leading discussion and introduce your guest and we'll get going. Sure, thank you. Uh, good morning, Jenica Machado, Economic Development Manager. Uh, we're going to try and condense this to um, meet the uh, 12 o'clock time. But today we've invited Mike Mason with the Nisqually Indian Tribe and Paul Walk to provide an overview and update on the ARPA funded broadband projects. Just a quick recap, um, the beginning of these projects bring us back to 2022. Uh, COVID highlighted the digital divide here locally and across the country, and it really accelerated the importance for broadband connectivity. Recognizing the need to support broadband expansion projects specifically to our rural areas uh, we partnered with the Nisqually Indian Tribe. Back in March of 2022, the board approved the interlocal agreement with the Nisqually Indian Tribe to conduct a countywide broadband coverage survey and pre-engineer select routes. In December of 2022, the board approved a contract amendment uh, to add formal engineering for the routes in the Southeast Rainier and Yelm area. Uh, and so then I'll pass it over to Mike and Paul to provide an update on these projects and what's to come next. So the quick update is that the tribe started this uh, five years ago. They wired and we laid out uh, fiber communications to the residents on the tribe. And we worked with CURB to get our funding. And when it, that was pre-COVID. We realized the uh, complexity and, and the needs for that. And we found that uh, we could handle doing that. And we started to reach out and see the outer communities needed this. <laughs> and then COVID hit. And fortunately, after COVID and everything and the infrastructure money came out, they realized that this is a big deal, that communications need to be, you know, really done upright. So we were already at it when this started. And we had a communications company. We had a, a construction company. We helped Chehala start a construction company. We've been linking up to other tribes and other communities and other counties. We always felt that if we partner together, we can get more accomplished and it will help us with the grants working with the state and the feds. So with that said, that's where we are. We partner together. We're a unique position compared to anybody else in Washington state. Um, we have a pretty large project and right now we're going on to the next phase for funding coming up. And I know we're discussing of uh, the, the ARPA money, right? And because we have a deadline, the state is going through, Commerce is going through their side trying to figure out how we can use the matching funds. And we're having that cumbersome because they're not going to be able to award the projects by the due date. That's the, what we're afraid of. And they're trying to come up with a resolve behind the scenes. And we haven't got an answer. But with that said, I want to really turn the, most of the meeting over to Paul Walk. He's our engineer. He's been with us since day one and he can give you an update of the entire project and potentially what we're going from here. Because there's some exciting news what we're doing. The other thing, great news I, I wanna really point out is that we have a huge relationship with Astound. It used to be Wave Communications, now it's Astound. So they're, when we started working on them, they were like the eighth or ninth largest provider in the United States. Through their acquisitions, they're about the third largest now. So they're really been building. On top of that, they're meeting with us to do a partnership and agreement between the Thurston County and the tribe and Paul with the Redline Communications has facilitated that for us. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Paul online. Yeah, hello everyone. Uh, appreciate taking the time to go over this today. Uh, does someone have control of the slides? I see the first page on there. I'm gonna try to breeze through these to make this quick, but if we can get to the second page of that slide, That'd be great. So to date, uh, Nisqually through the different state and federal applications uh, has received $15.2 million for broadband projects. Uh, if we can hit the next slide. So the next slide shows our WSB01 project that uh, engineering is complete, permitting is complete, RFP is completed, and construction contractor is um, ready to begin work on this. Uh, this provides broadband service, uh, 10 gig symmetrical service up to um, 
to 851 subscribers that currently did not have services. So pretty good project. If we can hit the next slide. Um, this is the curb project. This is the one of the first projects we started out with this built fiber to the home to the entire reservation. And they're on a GPON system. So everybody has one gig symmetrical service throughout the reservation. Uh, next slide. This run is our second curb application uh, that we awarded. This one leaves the Nisqually tribe and goes um, down to Yelm and from Yelm over through um, the Tenino area to the Rochester um, over to the Chehalis tribe. Uh, that is bringing the service. This is a 10 gig symmetrical service to 1200 subscribers. Uh, next slide, please. This is the NTA round one application we were awarded. This is a communication shelter that's uh, being placed on the reservation. This is where all the fiber from the tribes projects is going to demark and integrate. Next slide, please. This is the overview of what has been awarded to date. Um, you know, currently this is just under a hundred miles of fiber optic infrastructure that's uh, being put in place and bringing service to a lot of unserved areas of Thurston County. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we're going to breeze through this. I, I understand that it was already covered previously. So next slide, please. Next slide, please. Uh, part of those surveys allowed us to identify all the un and underserved areas of Thurston County. That's what this uh, overview highlights. Uh, we created a budget for all the un and underserved areas as well. Um, this was prior to the state coming out, or not the state necessarily, but the, uh, the FCC coming out with their own criteria for speed tests. Um, the good news is we have that data now that they have released in April. And we've been cross-referencing that data with the data that we collected. And we're finding that there's about a 90% similarity. Next slide, please. So out of that area that we reviewed, we identified uh, a project to go after WSBO round two funding. And I believe Jenica and the county has a copy of those completed engineering design prints that we finished. And uh, we applied for this project in round two. And while we scored good enough to uh, be awarded, there was a lot of competition and we were not awarded that project. Um, next slide, please. The good news is that there is a new round of funding, which I'm sure everybody's familiar with, the bead funding through NTIA. That's part of the, the national infrastructure funding um, from the Biden administration. And we have the engineering completed for this next application. There is a little bit of refinement that needs to take place um, based on the new state maps of eligibility, but it will not take us much to tweak the engineering designs that we currently have to make that part of a uh, 2024 bead application. There's gonna be two rounds of funding as we understand it to date with the first NOFO coming out um, in winter of this year. And the state got $1.2 billion and they've set aside $250 million in matching funds for public entities to apply to uh, for their projects. Um, the way we understand it is that if a public entity applies for those matching funds uh, and still puts down a percentage of the project funds, so I guess the way I'm understanding it to date is if we were able to put down 5%, we get an additional 30 points, and 10%, we get an additional 40 points. So this is leading us to um, identifying a project that we can provide matching funds for, but also hopefully provide at least 5 or even 10% of the match to. This current project um, with today's cost that we applied for in 2022 for WSPO, this project will be about a $12 million application. And currently there's a 25% match in that uh, for the bead funding. 
So we are looking to have a partnership possibly with Astound. Um, we have a meeting coming up. There's, you know, nothing has been, you know, decided, but there is a meeting that uh, we've asked for the county, uh, Astound and Nisqually to attend to discuss a public private partnership. Um, the state has uh, referenced that they're going to give preference to partnerships in this round of funding. And so we believe that it will be a, uh, a very well-rounded application um, between a service provider, a county, and a tribe. Uh, we're also told the private partner um, can be the, uh, the owner of the infrastructure as well as um, a split between the, own, the private and public. We know that Thurston County is not interested in owning the infrastructure. Uh, however, Nisqually and Astound are. So currently, um, what we're toying with is having this existing application be resubmitted you know, with some refinement uh, with Nisqually as the owner of that infrastructure and Astound as the committed service provider. And then we have the other areas throughout Thurston County that we have identified and are continuing to evaluate to create a larger application uh, that would join this um, the Squally Thurston County application. So the hope is to cover as much of the unserved areas of Thurston County as possible and one application and one partnership. So again, nothing solidified, but that is what the intent is as of today. I think that we could provide a much better update here in the next month or two. Uh, the good news is we do have quite a bit of time before uh, winter of this year. We don't know exactly when uh, winter of this year is going to be. And, you know, we, I'm assuming any time between uh, October to December. So that's pretty much where we're at right now. Um, I think it would probably be a good time to answer questions from those that may have them. Can you back up two or three slides? Back up. Please. You just need to turn the wheel. There you go. Yeah, well, okay. Oh, there we go. What are the, which one do you want to go? Next one. What do the colors represent again? So uh, the red represents underground and the blue represents aerial. The light blue is areas that we went ahead. We've got fiber maps of existing providers in Washington state. So we created paths from these areas that we defined to those service providers closest fiber locations so that we could help def uh, define projects with, with budgets for each particular area. So we wound up with an overall budget for everything that's un and underserved in Thurston County. And we have isolated budgets for pockets as well. So that represents existing infrastructure that doesn't show like un underserved area. Like it's not like red is vitally under what? No, everything that is in this map is identified as unserved. Okay. And if the, everything that is blue, red, the orange represents directional drill where we have to utilize that for construction. But everything identified in here is construction that would need to take place. That's the yeah. new construction. So that's the the different colors. You know what would go underground, what would go aerial. That's what he. That's what this map shows. Okay, thank you. And we have delivered to the county. Um, if you want to further review those, we've delivered these in shape files and KMZs along with uh, Excel bud, uh, budget spreadsheets that define this better. Thank you. When you were on your last slide there and you were, I kind of got confused by all the different things that were there. Yeah, right there. You were talking about, I was writing something down about more points if we provide 5% match versus 10% match, whatever. And then, then you go, it said it's a $12 million ask and there's 25% match. So I'm getting confused as to what, what different programs we're asking for money for and how this changes for the county where we were before. Yeah, so the way that it is, is we're 
We're asking for $12 million for this project. There's a 25% match um, for this project with the state. However, because there's a public entity involved in the application, we can apply for matching funds. And if we apply for matching funds, then we don't get the 5% or the, t or the opportunity to put the 5% or the 10% down. Um, so we still have to work with the state to understand if there is an option of us requesting you know, 10% of that, 15% of that, and providing the additional five or 10% to still get those points, or if we have to provide five and 10% with no request for matching funds. That is an area, uh, most of this information has just come out in the last couple of weeks. And so we need to refine that information. Uh, however, Astound has uh, stated that they are willing to commit a portion of funds towards this as well. Uh, my job is to make sure that I can meet their ROI um, in a project that we build, and then that will determine what percentage of matching funds they will be willing to commit. And then we also have to define whether or not, like I stated before, um, how that matching funds from the state will be utilized with this. Uh, currently, I, what would be ideal is if the county could, I believe the county had previously committed a million dollars towards um, you know, future broadband projects. We can't say that we need that right now, um, but we can't say that we don't. Um, and I guess that's where I was kind of ending up at the end of the conversation was, I think we can provide a better update in the next 30 to 60 days once we are able to define a little more information from the state. Um, and once we have that, then we'll better understand this. And our money was ARPA money, right? Our money is the ARPA money. And we have a timing issue on that. But, and that's exactly December where 31st. I was about to go. And, so Robin, yeah, I want to hear Robin's. Thank you. Um, so I really appreciate this update. Um, it does answer the questions that Commissioner Edwards has and also gives us an opportunity to chat about where we're at. Um, with ARPA, the county does still have a million dollars earmarked toward future broadband projects. Um, and our challenge is that by December 31st of this year, we must have the money obligated however we're going to spend it. And then it <coughs> must be spent in the following two years by December 31st of 2026. If we don't know if this project is going to be funded until the winter of this year, that will not give the county an opportunity if, if this million dollars can't be spent to spend it on something else. We don't want to lose it. So waiting until this, the end of this year to find out is much too late for us. Um, the Board of County Commissioners is going to be assessing probably in June um, what money is um, still on the table that does not have a firm plan around it. So to hear that you're going to have a better sense of where things are going in 30 to 60 days is wonderful, um, but we're going to need to know that this million dollars can be used before December 2026. Um, and we're gonna need a firm commitment on that probably by June. So we're working with Department of Commerce and we've been in great discussions, specifically <laughs> this, because Thurston's not the only one that's trying to use the ARPA money. So they are, it's, it's on their table right now dilemma because we've pointed out you're not going to go award this till after the first of the year probably and we have to have this allocated by december so they're behind the scenes trying to figure out with the feds how they can do this so we told them that's great but we need an answer yesterday we we're putting pressure on them and same as other counties because it is that's not much time to allocate and put a plan together and all of a sudden you can't use that money towards broadband we don't how want quickly can you put a plan to together to use the other yeah dollars, exactly right. so we very much understand and we're working diligently 
Um, so this is this is building a new utility. It's putting in a bunch of infrastructure. There's a bunch of public money involved, but it eventually becomes what is basically a private utility, in a sense. Uh, but there's public a ton of mo ton of public money going into it. What does the rate structure look like when it's all built, and how do you, how do you factor in? The public funds have been used, so there should be subsidized rates and not necessarily market rates, or is it like... And I'm with you 100% on that one. And that one, it seemed like it got thrown out the window, because in the very beginning, because we were in our third year of broadband with the infrastructure money, and, and originally it was also the speed, you know, it was, uh, it was a requirement on speed, then was a requirement on open access, it was... We also put a requirement on keeping the price down for the average customer. And there are no requirements now. Uh, open access isn't being followed. There which, are you know, still requirements under ARPA. Yep, and we follow those. But, you know, the, the like you're just discussing right now, this is the Nisqually tribe, we're going to take possession because we can handle We have a construction company. We know we can do the maintenance. Mm -hmm. So we know our break-even cost, you know. We didn't want to turn it over to a for-profit entity and it go through the roof. But the reason, that's the other reason we work with this town. Because they've been amicable about working with the community. We tell them we're really serious, concerned about the high prices. But I still see $100, $120 for a high, you know, one gig internet coming from them too, from other communities. So the answer, will we get a better price? I can't answer that. You know, we work, I think, when we bring us down and we talk to them on our partnership, I think we also bring that to the table to them, too, that we're concerned. You know, we'd like to see if they can help out our community. But I don't see that happening right now. And that was my biggest thing. That's cause, tough because we're putting it's in millions of dollars 120 of money for they... one gig, you know, yeah. right now. That's what about the average cost is because I paid that at home on a senior discount. And it's still ridiculous, you know. <laughs> So, and I know it should be a lot better, but uh, in the very beginning, we were at a $49 mark for up and down speed for one gig. That went out the window. And, and then that was between state and feds. Actually, they, my answer was when I go to the, you know, Congress and when we go to the Senate to, to you know, testify our budgets, I just said, you know, the lobbyists did a great job. That's how I start my conversation with the budget committee because half the stuff is gone off the table. And so, then the community is not getting what we're supposed to get. Well, exactly. And those requirements may no longer be tied to the state money of what the Washington State Broadband Office is doling out, but they are definitely required under ARPA. Oh, yeah. So if we're going to put this million dollars of ARPA money into a project, it must require affordable rates for disadvantaged communities and I believe it also requires the open access. Either that or we have to have appropriately bid this project. And I think that open access was how we... So, so the just to let you know, our, out of all the projects that are out there, this is the only project that's bona fide open access. Okay. So all the other entities out there are open access and this is how they do it. We, we're going to partner up with a stound, okay? But let's say a stound takes over the maintenance. They charge a set fee. They're, and you partner up with a provider to do all the maintenance and everything. And what the fee, and you get your agreement done, and this is happening in other communities. They get that fee so high that outside uh, providers are going, that's too expensive for us. So it's open, but it's not open because of revenue. Okay, so literally every other entity in Washington is set up that way. And just so you know, Thurston is the only one that truly is an open access. So we, we, we are following. We and dot our eyes across our teeth. partners, and I don't mean anything. Oh, no, 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 no. I know that. But I just yeah. want to brag about that. That That's <laughs> what, to me, you know, Thurston and Nisqually is we're, we're, we're walking the talk. You know, whereas the others, the lobbyists got their job's done. That's the only thing I can say that how it ended up to where it is today. I think you have that we have a unique partnership too. That that is something that both the tribe and the county can be extremely proud of. 
um, and how to move it. We're looking for a path forward, but the timing from the state on the grant awards is killing us. And I think part of the uh, trouble is that the state is sending their funding recommendation to NTIA and that time frame of when that- NTIA. Uh, NTIA, what did I say? Uh, yeah, so NTIA. And so then once um, that decision from NTIA will be passed down, will be like March to May, 2025. What does NTIA stand for? The National Telecommunication. Communications infrastructure, um, no problem. Oh. I just always say it by the acronym, and I guess I can't even get that. Give me a couple weeks, I'll be with you. Um, but so I think that's part of the challenge in them providing a timely um, award notice is they've talked about doing conditional award notices, but that isn't going to be matched up with the federal timeline. Okay, what else do we need to cover? Beth, mind if I add a, a quick point? Yeah, go ahead, Paul. I just want to point out that through round, through the curb application process, round one and round two of WSPO, uh, there hasn't been any other applications received for Thurston County. So this, this partnership has really um, been the only opportunity for Thurston County to receive, you know, broadband funding for the un and underserved areas um, so you know i want to really uh, commend what you guys have all been doing because the constituency throughout thurston county would be in a much worse place if this hadn't taken place and just to another another point on the open access is you know you have to have a committed service provider for an open access network in order to be able to fund it correct so while we have uh, astound as a committed partner and we have followed ARPA um, requirements by ensuring that astound was uh, registered with the, AC the FCC's ACP, the Affordability Connect program, um, that was really how you ensure that you keep your prices down for the disadvantaged um, communities within Thurston County. Unfortunately, the FCC um, Congress had only appropriated funding for that until April 1st of this year. So we are awaiting um, information on whether or not they're gonna reappropriate funds to that, um, to that ACP program. We're hopeful they will, but all the people who were, were getting assistance are no longer getting assistance. So it's really important that the providers that we decide to work with have an entry level price and an entry level program um, which some providers don't. Um, what's happening, and I'll try to make this quick and everybody's on a, on a tight schedule today, but what's happening is the backhaul cost, which is the pipeline that comes in to feed the broadband, is going down fast. Uh, the, the price is going down and the speed requests are going up. And so what most providers are doing, instead of passing on those savings to the subscribers, they're increasing the rates, uh, the rates of speed. And so now where you used to be able to uh, receive a 25-3 connection, now they're saying your minimum is 100 by 20 or 100 symmetrical. And it's not because they think that you need that additional speed, it's because they want to keep retaining those funds that they have coming in. And so I think it's important, and I'm working on projects like this across the country in disadvantaged areas, and it's important that we work with service providers that have entry-level packages at affordable rates around that 30 to $40 a month range. Um, so that's something that Astound has committed to. And, but just to give a little more, um, you know, ease of how we're doing things, it, the open access network is built to where any provider at any time can connect to it and provide services. That's not designed for one provider. It's a simple cross connect with a new provider. They build their fiber to our connection. They cross connect their fiber to ours and they're in service. So it truly is an open access network and it's open to everybody. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mike. Thank you, Paul, for being here. Appreciate the update. More to come. Stop. That brings us to the end of the agenda this uh, morning, so we are adjourned.